May I please call the question? On July 18th, 1990, Danny Harold Rowling walked into an Army Navy store. It was in Tallahassee, Florida. It was near the bus station. He made a purchase. He paid about $34 plus tax. He bought an item. The item he purchased was a Marine Corps K-Bar knife, just like this one. In a very real sense, that was the first step in a plan that became an episode that will forever be remembered as the Gainesville student murders. It resulted in the deaths as a result of the rampage of Danny Harrell Rowling of five people, young students in this community, Sonia Larson, Christine Powell, Krista Hoyle, Manuel Taboda, and Tracy Paulus. For years, most of you, like everyone else in the community who's ever watched anything about this case, expected that a day would come in which someone would stand accused of that crime before a court. The victim's families, the community, the judge, the attorneys, and a jury, though surely you didn't expect to be on that jury, would make a decision about who did it and how it was done. That day never happened and it will never occur because Danny Rowling, on the day when the guilt phase of these proceedings was scheduled to begin, came into court and admitted that he was guilty to each of the 11 crimes in the indictment that arose out of these events. It never happened because he chose on that day to admit to these crimes rather than face the mountains of evidence that the state had compiled on the issue of guilt. So from that day forward, the question of guilt has been, as we told you in jury selection, as the court has reminded you, and we will remind you forever, closed. Danny Rowling stands there, sits there, as the person who killed, in murder in the first degree, Sonia, Christine, Krista, Manuel, and Tracy. On that day, he pled guilty not only to the murder in the first degree, but he admitted that he entered each of the buildings where they resided. First in the apartment of Sonia and Christine, then in the apartment of Krista, then in the apartment of Manuel and Tracy while he was armed. He was armed with a knife just like this. He was armed with a nine millimeter automatic weapon. That was armed burglary. That issue is now foreclosed. He admitted on that occasion that before he murdered Christine Powell in the first degree, he raped her. Before he murdered Krista Hoyt in the first degree, he raped her. And before he murdered Tracy Pauls in the first degree, he raped her. Over the next several days, the state will follow up on what must have seemed to you an exhaustive and an intrusive and maybe at times even an embarrassing procedure of jury selection. You've now been selected. You are the ones that are going to make a recommendation to, to his honor about what penalty should be imposed for those crimes that he has admitted to. Over the same next several days, the state of Florida will present evidence to you to prove how each of these crimes occurred. Now you note that I said how, remember why. Who is behind us? It's him. Why isn't an issue you need to worry about and you probably could never know? It is improving the how that the state will establish the aggravators that the statutes of the state of Florida allow you to weigh in the balance in making your decision against whatever excuses Danny Rowley may offer for his conduct. 
At this point, I think I should stop and say good morning. I remind you I'm Rod Smith, and that over the next few days, my staff will be with me. Jim Nylon, Gene Singer, Don Royston, Kevin Jericho, Carolyn Sturkowski will be assisting me in what I consider a great privilege, and that is presenting the penalty phase evidence in this case. And let me echo for you again a little bit about where we are procedurally. This is called the opening statement. What I say to you, as the court has already said, is not the evidence, but it is a prediction of the evidence that the, the state will establish, and it is a summary of that evidence that the state will establish, and it's very important because what it does is allow us, in this case, as in every case, where the rules of, and the predicates, if you will, the ground rules of how lawyers operate, sometimes mean that evidence doesn't always come in in a smooth, chronological or narrative fashion. One thing kind of doesn't always flow to the next. This allows us to tell you what we're going to prove to you so that when it comes in, when you see a piece of evidence, when you hear a piece of testimony, you'll be able to put it in its proper perspective and know what it means to the overall case that the state is going to present to you. I sometimes call this phase of the proceedings, the preview of the coming events. It is a little blip, but it's very important because what I tell you for the next few minutes will constitute once and for all what the state is going to prove to you in this case really happened and how the crimes that are known as the Gainesville student murders really were carried out. I also want to tell you that one of the things that you will note, the court will tell you about, is over the next several days, we will put on a shorter case in, in some sense that we will allow witnesses to take the stand and give you summaries and narratives to explain to you what they learned from various sources without having to always put in those underlying sources. Because much of that would have gone to a question of establishing guilt. And remember, we already know who's guilty. We already know who committed these crimes. What we're going to do now is examine how they happen. Starting today, the state will prove to you that after Danny Rowling purchased the military K bar knife in Tallahassee, and we'll provide you evidence of why he picked this particular weapon, because he believed it was so good for killing. He left Tallahassee. He left Tallahassee on the 22nd of July, and he went to Sarasota, Florida. The state will prove to you that when he went to Sarasota, Florida, he stayed down there until approximately August the 22nd. We're going to have a witness come in from FDLE, explain to you carefully how we've been able to track his steps down there. We're going to show you that he made some purchases while he was in Sarasota, and among the items he purchased in Sarasota was a 9 millimeter pistol an automatic weapon. The state will show you then that he got the gun in Sarasota after he got the knife in Tallahassee and then he came to Gainesville. The state's going to prove that on August excuse me, on August the 18th he arrived in Gainesville, Florida. He checked into the University Inn. He stayed there at the University Inn as a tenant until August the 23rd. The state will prove to you that he checked out of the University Inn on that occasion and that he moved into the woods in southwest Gainesville to set up a campsite. To facilitate this, he went to the Walmart store in the southwest area of Gainesville and he bought a couple of items. He purchased a tent. He purchased a mattress but he also stole some items in that same, same trip. The items he stole didn't have anything to do with camping. It was a screwdriver, it was duct tape, and it was two pair of tight-fitting athletic gloves. He now had his weapons, he now had his tools, he moved into the woods. 
We're going to show you that on the evening of the 23rd, you're going to hear some language from a tape where Danny Rowling is sitting and he's playing a tape. Now, you'll find that that tape was a, was a continuation of a tape that he had started when he had been in Sarasota, Florida on a tape recorder that he had had down in Sarasota, Florida. He would be, you'll find that he's sitting in the woods and he has some conversations. He, he bids a farewell to his mom and his dad. You'll hear that. And you'll hear that uh, he talks to his brother about the proper way to, to kill a deer, specifying how you hit certain vital organs, you get a quick kill. You'll hear that. And then he signs off with what surely will be forever remembered as one of the most ominous phrases ever uttered in Gainesville when he says, and you will hear, I got to sign off now. There's something I got to go do. He clicks off the tape and he leaves. You will find from the evidence the state will prove that he later admits that what he had to go do was to commence the slaughter he had planned of students in this community. You will find that the tools that he took from the Walmart, he will later admit, he specifically got them for the reason they were ultimately employed, and that was the break-in of the apartments in which the murders took place, in which he killed in cold blood these five young people. The state will show you that these acts were planned, calculated, and cold. We will show that when he left the woods in southwest Gainesville, he began to roam around the area. We're going to provide evidence to you that he came up to a, either a duplex or an apartment, and he saw a woman, her back was turned to him. He watched her. The predator found his prey. He prepared to go. And then for some inexplicable reason, someone walked up. Danny Rowling ran off. He went to another apartment complex. While he was at the other apartment complex, he spied on two more girls. He approached the apartment. And then through that same unexplicable force, a security guard walked up. Danny Rowling ran off again, but he would not be denied his plan that night. Because at three o'clock in the morning, he approached the back of building 11, apartment 113 in Gainesville, at a complex known as the Williamsburg Complex. You will find, ladies and gentlemen, and the state will prove to you that on that night, he approached the apartment. He went up to the back door. He pried it. It popped open. Now, ladies and gentlemen, on that night, the state's going to prove to you he wasn't wearing a suit. He didn't have on a blazer, no tie. He wasn't dressed up like you see him now. What you will find is that he was wearing black ninja clothes, dark clothing for the dark night and the dark purpose. He had on a ski mask to cover his face because he didn't want to be seen. He tried the door. It popped open. He entered the apartment. It's three in the morning. Downstairs, he finds 17-year-old Christy. She's asleep. He stands over. He calculates. He better check it out. The evidence will show that he was upstairs. He looks around upstairs, and in one of the bedrooms, he finds a sleeping Sonia Larson. Danny stands over her. He's got his gun. He's got his knife. He's going to use his knife. It's quieter. He decides which one he's going to rape and which one he's going to eliminate. He takes this knife and he plunges it into a sleeping Sonia Larson. But there's no screen or uh, there's no warning, by the way, because he's thought of everything. Remember the duct tape, the double double piece of duct tape goes over her mouth at the same time as the first blow. She wakes, she struggles. The state will prove that she fought. You will find wounds on her hands and arms to establish that. As she struggled, he stabbed her several times. He watched her as she died. 
her mouth taped over, her cries muffled. He goes back downstairs. Downstairs, Christy's still asleep. He's on her before she knows what happens. He takes her hands behind her back. We're going to present to you an evidence of what happened in that apartment in the following way. You're going to find that he takes the knife. Cuts off her clothing. He takes the knife and he cuts off her bra. He forces her to commit oral sex on him. When he told this story, you're going to find the person he told, one of the persons he told it to hardly believed it because he's, he thought, wait a minute, nobody would, would be like that. She must have cried out. She might have bit you. What? No, you'll find that she was so thoroughly terrified that she was willing to do anything he demanded to stay alive. He then raped her. He then turned her over after a while after he was through with her and he stabbed her in the back and he killed her while she was still taped. We're going to show you what the feelings were in that room. We're going to produce evidence that while he was having sex with her, she cried out in pain to which we will provide you evidence that he later bragged of saying, take the pain, bitch, take the pain. The state's going to show you that after he killed her, he took the tape off her hands, he took the tape off her mouth, he went over to the refrigerator, and he got some fruit, an apple and a banana, and he ate it. Now we know that because we've got evidence that we'll present to you that he admits to it, and secondly, we know it because we took that evidence and matched it against photographs that we took of the apartment. And, and at that apartment, you're going to find the very fruit he recalls so vividly eating after he had killed both girls, after he had raped Christine. He goes back upstairs. He untapes Sonia. He poses her body. He goes back downstairs. He poses the other body, Christina. He's got him just right. He leaves. The next crime, by the way, was already in the planning stages. Unknown to anyone in the world, save only his mind, that victim had already been picked. You will find, from evidence that we will provide for you, that Danny Rowling had previously been prowling in the southwest area of Gainesville during that same week that he'd been here, maybe even the night before. And he went to the back of an apartment really a small duplex in Southwest Gainesville, and he saw a girl emerging from the shower. He watched her towel off. He didn't know what her name was. He found her attractive. We know who she was. She was Krista Holt. He watched her, and he left. But he was by no means through, the evidence will show, with Krista Hoyt. We're going to prove to you that on the afternoon of the 25th, it was a Saturday afternoon, Albert Hoover, Mr. Hoover is a uh, landlord of, that was Christina's landlord, uh, excuse me, Krista's landlord. Uh, he noticed the gate latch was unlocked beside the duplex apartment. He had noticed it earlier. So he decided to go check on his tenant. He knocked on the door. Krista came to the door. It was about 5 o'clock, and he said, you know, the gate was unlocked, uh, Krista. You know, we need to keep that gate locked. Evidence will be that one of the reasons why is that that gate is to a work is to a little work area and storage area that goes around to the rear of her apartment. It's the exclusive method by which you would get to the rear of the apartment. She thought for a second, and she said to him something to the effect that it could have been the telephone man. He was out here working today. Mr. Hoover will tell you that that he thought about it a second. He had seen a telephone truck, although he hadn't seen one in her particular apartment, but he dismissed it. He went back, he latched the gate, and he left. Went back to his apartment. 
Well, we know, we know now, and the evidence will show you why that gate was unlatched that afternoon. Because we know now, the evidence we will present to you that he had already been there, that he had already been to the back of the apartment, that he had already peeked through the, through the little jalousies at the bottom of the sliding glass door, which we will show you pictures of. That evening, about maybe nine o'clock, Danny Rowling returned to where he had seen the girl tallying off. He took that screwdriver. He was wearing that same black outfit, that same ski mask, carrying that same gun. Took the screwdriver, busted in the sliding glass door at the rear bedroom. We'll show you how that happened. He broke in. He went into a small duplex apart on one side. He walked to the front. We're going to show you pictures of some computer enhanced graphics showing you what happened at these crime scenes. When he got to the front door of the apartment, he saw there was a bookshelf right by the front door. That bookshelf right by the front door, we'll show you, is just deep enough that if a person stands in that little alcove by the front door, they can stand there and the person coming through the front door won't, won't know they're there. The other thing you will see is that all you had to do was lean over and you could watch someone coming into the apartment. Danny Rowling took the bookshelf and moved it to the back bedroom. He took the items off the bookshelf, he put them in a pill pillowcase that was on the bed in her room. He went back to the front, he stood, he watched, and he waited. Now during this time, Krista was with a friend of hers, Paul Schwartz. Paul's going to testify that they were out playing racquetball. About nine o'clock, they finished their racquetball game. They went to Paul's house, they had some refreshments, they had some cold drinks with Paul, talked to Paul's parents. About 9.45, she left, and she returned to that apartment. Evidence will show that she parked the car where she normally does. We'll show you the approach to the, to the apartment. You walk a little ways from where you park. You walk up to the front door. As she walked to that front door, you will see that Danny was able to see her coming. She unlocked the door. She came in. The evidence will show you that she was almost immediately a sense of something wrong, but it was too late. He was on her from behind. He put her in a chokehold. He choked her to the ground. She struggled. When her struggling finally subsided, he taped her hands behind her back. Her double tape tape again over her mouth. He got her up. He took her to the back bedroom. He cut off her clothes again. Now, we're going to show you the evidence of the clothes, but one of the things that the state will show you that you will need to know is that the cuts run from the bottom all the way to the top and vice versa. What that means is, I think we will provide expert testimony that you had to be pretty close right in somebody's face when you made that cut. You just got to keep the shirt down. Cut it up. He cut her clothes off of her. He laid her on the bed. He began to sexually play with her for what the evidence will show he's later termed a fairly long time. While he was playing with her sexually, he discovered she was on her period. Pulled out her tampon, threw it in the corner. He raped her. He turned her over. She couldn't say anything, but she was muffled. You will hear that. He told them. You will hear evidence that he told his victims what he was going to do to them. He turned her over, <clears throat> stabbed her through the back, through her heart, and she died. He posed her body. He left the apartment. Went back to his campsite. But when he got back to his campsite, the evidence is going to show something wrong for Danny. What went wrong that night for Danny was that uh, he couldn't find his apartment. He thought he must have lost his wallet back at the apartment. So he returned. He goes back to the apartment, breaks into the apartment again, 
And he looks for his wallet, but he doesn't find it. The evidence is, though, that he now repositions the body because he finds that rigor mortis is set in. And now he can take the body and he can do things with it he couldn't do before. So he sets her up on the side of the bed, he poses her. You'll see evidence of this. And he leaves what he later termed, which we will present evidence to you on, a message to Gainesville. He then leaves, goes to a phone. It's now almost morning. Picks up the phone, makes a phone call. Calls 911, gets the police department. Wants to report that his wallet under the name Mike Kennedy, the name we will show you that he used in Tallahassee, the alias that he used in Sarasota, the same alias that he used when he got to Gainesville, that his wallet under the name Mike Kennedy has been missing. He wanted to report that. He returned to his campsite. It's now, you see this, We'll present you dates for your witnesses explaining to you each of the dates. It's now time for the 27th. He's now at Gatorwood Apartments. He's been roaming Southwest Gainesville again, and he's watching, and he's peeking in, and he sees a girl, and he watches her for a while. He stands in the dark. He's dressed in black, remember? He's got on a ski mask, remember? He watches her. He waits, he takes that screwdriver, the one he stole. He's armed as he was before. And he pops the pin at the side of the apartment on a sliding glass door there. And he pops that pin out and he breaks in and he goes inside. But he doesn't go straight to the girl's room because just like he did in scene one, the evidence will show he's got to check out to make sure there's a witness if that person needs to be eliminated so he can have his way. He goes to the other bedroom, not the one he saw her in. When he goes in there, he sees a sleeping Manuel Tabota. It's three o'clock in the morning, remember? Manuel's evidence is going to show you a large guy with a large frame. And he gets over it. Plunges a knife just like this one with great force all the way through Manuel Tabota from the solar plexus. But what happens is Manuel surprises Danny. Manuel comes out of his sleep. Manuel fights with Danny. You will see evidence in this case of that fight. But what I will tell you is he curses Danny. He holds Danny. He almost gets Danny according to Danny's own story. He has to stab him 30 times almost to kill him. But he does get his job done. When he finishes that, just as he completes killing Manuel, Tracy Paulus, it's a small apartment, we'll give you the dimensions. Tracy Paulus has emerged, she has emerged from her room to see what's going on. As she comes out, Danny sees her. He turns to her, he thinks she's armed. What you'll find is she really had a curling iron in her hand. She sees what's happened, she screams once. She goes in her room, across the hallway, he chases her. He kicks in the door, she's trying to close. You will find on that door, Manuel's blood to Tracy's bedroom. Tracy had called a couple hours earlier. She had called a friend. The friend she had called, and we'll present this testimony to you, is a person who she had talked about her fear because she found out there had been some bodies discovered in Gainesville, and she was very concerned that Manuel better get home pretty soon because she was very, very concerned about his killings. Now what you see is that what you will find is that Tracy's now seeing a man covered in blood, Manuel's, wearing a ski mask, black ninja outfit. She's just seen him finish killing Manuel. She's made the call before. She puts it all together because she turns and she says to him, you're the one, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I'm the one. Tapes her mouth, tapes her hands behind her back, puts her on the bed. Well, that duct tape puts it on that window. He's going to be there for a while. He doesn't want somebody to seeing him. Sexually plays with her, takes her t-shirt, 
cuts it off just like he has the other scenes. Then he talks to her a while, tells her what he's going to do. Then he rapes her. He rapes her by anal sodomy on her in that apartment. Then when he's through, he turns her over. And through him, you'll have evidence that all she could do was muffle her protest. He killed her by stabbing her in the back. Takes her body, drags it out in the hall, cleans it off, and poses it. Now I say cleans it off. We're going to provide you evidence both at scene one and at scene three. That what he does is he takes dishwashing liquid that he finds at the apartment and he, he cleans off the bodies and he douches them out with dishwashing, with dishwashing detergent because that gets rid of evidence. Cleans her off. We're going to show you pictures of the dishwashing detergent in scene one. We're going to show you the sheen on Tracy Paulus's body as she's laying in the hall. He leaves that apartment. He forgets and leaves one piece of tape at that scene. It's up on the window. It's almost daylight. He gets out a little faster than he has before. The evidence will be that he left there and he goes across the street for what he, what he tries to decide. And we'll talk about that during the evidence. What appears to have been an old dilapidated building that may have been used for some IFAS purposes a few years ago by the University of Florida. He finds an old building in the woods and he takes, it, he takes the knife and the bloody gloves. He wraps them together and he sticks them down on the ground and he buries them. He goes back. He's, he'll, we'll have evidence about his movement of his campsite. We'll have evidence about the events that happened next. Now, this is the evidence of the three scenes that we will present to you, but there will also be evidence from the campsite. Let's talk about how we're going to show you how we got to the campsite. The state's going to prove that the same calendar day, almost the next day, this, late the next, this night, remember it was 3 o'clock in the morning of the 27th, late that night you're going to find that they, there's a deputy in the South Coast area on patrol, deputy, Alachua Sheriff's Office Deputy Merrill. He observes two people walking up along 34th Street. Black guy and a white guy. It's late in the night. He pulls out just to observe what's going on. All of a sudden, he notices him jump off the, the, the area beside the road and head into the woods. He calls for backup. When backup arrives, they, they start going down a little easement into the woods. They get close enough to where they can see the black guy and the taller white guy, and they yell for him to stop. The black guy does, but the white guy goes on. Deputy Liddell trails him until the white guy breaks off and goes out into the woods off of the easement. Liddell calls for canine backup, which soon, soon arrives in the form of Chuck Sexton and his canine support dog. They come to the spot where they go into the woods and Liddell says this is where he entered. The dog goes on trail and they go out into the woods that night. They go a couple of hundred yards and they up and come upon what? A tent. We'll show you evidence that that tent was the tent that had made the campsite for Danny Rowe. Now at this time, what they see when they first get there is, and we'll provide you evidence of this, is they see money that's strewn on the ground uh, near the campsite, and it's what's called dye stained, dye packed money. It, it, it's turned red. Now, what that means to people who've been in law enforcement a while is that this is money that's been stolen from a bank, robbed from a bank. So now they know that they're likely on the trail of a bank robbery, well, there'd been a bank robbery that same morning. A bank robbery for which, by the way, we will present evidence that Danny Rowling was convicted. But when they approach that tent that night, they check her, they send the dog in the tent, the dog comes out, they go in the tent, they check it out, because they don't know where this guy is they're chasing and they don't know what they're after. They pull out a bag. In that bag, you're gonna find items that 
became very, very important in the development of this case. They find a screwdriver. They find some clothing. They find an automatic pistol. In the state's case, we will show to you and prove to you that that's the screwdriver that was used on the brake lines. That that's the weapon that was purchased in Sarasota that was worn in each of the crime scenes. They also found a tape recording. A tape. And ultimately, when played much later, that is the tape that was started down in Sarasota. That is the tape that contains that ominous phrase, there's something I gotta do. And that tape had a fingerprint on it, and that fingerprint turned out to be Danny Rowley. Just as all those Mike Kennedy receipts turned out to be in the handwriting of Danny Rowling. But at that point, in that time, at that point in time, in those woods that night, they didn't know that. What they knew was that they had somebody they were chasing who had been armed, that there was money, so they took it in evidence. We'll have the people explain what was done and follow up to that. They went back a day or so later and checked the area. They checked the area and they were doing what's called a grid search. And a grid search is an area by which, a method by which deputies kind of march off this way a little ways and march off this way a little ways and make sure that they covered the area. And in covering this area, they stumble across a loosely covered up second bag. The bag also has dye stained money. Therefore, they know it's likely related to the dye stained money they found over at the campsite during the night. Examination of that bag turns up a ski mask. The very ski mask, we will prove to you, the very ski mask that Danny Rowling wore on his face to avoid detection during each of these rapes and murders. Now, all of this is the kind of evidence that we are going to present to you about how these murders were carried out. Those are the facts of what happened. We are then now really not in the process of ever sending you back into that room to decide, well, did they get all that evidence right? We've got that evidence right as to that man being the one. What we're going to show you is just how it happened. And I tell you that what I've said to you now is how it happened, that we will prove to you what I said is a summary of what happened. But the important thing is the state, for the next few days, in its case of chief, will focus upon establishing specific aggravators, the kinds of aggravators that you will weigh in the balance against any excuses Danny Rowling may offer for his conduct. The aggravator, the aggravators then have to be proven in the same way that I told you before. I, I wish I could get up and tell you some sort of like folksy Matlock story and lean over the bar, wear a white suit, and at the end of it, you'd know exactly everything that happened. It won't happen that way. Albeit we'll prove everything I represented to you. But what we have to do is we have specific guidelines for the state. As I told you during jury selection, as the court instructed you during jury selection, as the defense said during jury selection, and as you will be told again later, we have statutory aggravators that we have to prove beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. The state believes that in these cases we will prove four or five statutory aggravators as to every one of these cold-hearted murders. Now, the first one we're going to get over this afternoon. I've really already explained it to you. Now I've got to prove it to you. The first piece of evidence that the state's going to admit will be a certified judgment from this very court. That'll be the first piece of evidence. And you may think, why is he doing that? Well, because that means that that certified judgment, as the court will explain to you, now becomes evidence. And what does that certified judgment tell us again? That Danny Rowling, as he sits here, is guilty of armed burglary, the knife, the gun, when he went into the apartments. He's been adjudicated guilty by this court. So beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt, you will have evidence 
that Danny Rowling has committed these murders in the course of an armed burglary. And remember, that is one of the aggravators under Florida law. The court will also instruct you that it is an aggravator. And remember, we talked about this in jury selection. It is an aggravator if you murder someone in the course of committing rape upon them, sexual battery. Danny Rowling pled guilty, was adjudicated. He is guilty, he sits there guilty of sexual battery with great force. First, sexual battery on 17-year-old Christine. Second, sexual battery on Krista Hoyt. You remember when she was bound, both of them. And anal sodomy, another form of sexual battery on Tracy Pauls. Therefore, before this day ends, I submit to you on behalf of the state, we will have established one aggravator. We will have put in a judgment that says, very simple, Danny Rowland is adjudicated guilty in these same cases as to armed burglary and sexual battery, and therefore the first statutory set of aggravators will beyond all reasonable doubt, any reasonable doubt, be established. That's one. And remember, aggravators are what? Those are those things which the court will instruct you by statute, will instruct you that you may weigh, you may weigh in the balance. You will have, before the day is out, an aggravator, an aggravator right there of the way he committed these murders, being in sexual battery, being accompanying armed burglary, that whatever story he comes up with in mitigation, whatever evidence he provides, excuse me, in mitigation, will be, could be weighed against that. But before the day is out, we're going to provide you additional evidence that goes directly to this, a different, a separate statutory aggravator. The second series of exhibits which the state will be presenting to you is specifically tailored to establish another aggravator. And that aggravator will be that Danny Rowland has been convicted of other crimes of violence, and therefore is a person with a violent history. Now, the way we're going to show you Danny Rowling's prior violent history is a series of certified judgments or judgments that have been stipulated in the court, and we will request the court to, to read a stipulation that has already been filed with this court as to his criminal, as to these particular judgments that we're going to present, which are his violent felony history. Let me show you, tell you what we're going to present, because it may seem a little stilted when we actually do it. You're going to wonder, what's all that paperwork? Let me tell you what that paperwork is. That paperwork is a life of adult crime. First exhibit will be a 1979 judgment from Muskogee County, Georgia. That judgment, that Muskogee County judgment, was for two counts of armed robbery. The state will then introduce a 1980 judgment from Montgomery County, Alabama. That judgment will show you that Danny Rowling was convicted in that state of robbery. The next judgment we will introduce will be a 1986 judgment from Hines County, Mississippi. That judgment will show you that he was again convicted and sentenced for armed robbery. Now again armed robbery, now again in another state. The next judgment will be from Marion County, Florida. It will establish that in 1991, Danny Rowling was convicted of robbery with a firearm in that nearby jurisdiction. The state will then introduce to you a 1991 judgment from the Hillsborough County Circuit Court, Hillsborough County, Florida, in which Danny Rowling was found guilty and adjudicated for three counts of robbery with a firearm, one count of attempted uh, 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 robbery with a firearm, and two counts of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. Next, the state will give you still another judgment that will be entered, a 1993 judgment from the federal court for the Northern Div United States Northern Division of Florida, the Gainesville Division, where he was adjudicated, convicted, 
for the crime of armed bank robbery. At that point in time, when we get through that paperwork, when it has been admitted in this case, and the stipulation has been read on its admissibility, you will have before you 12 prior violent felonies spanning 15 years in six different jurisdictions. But that isn't all that we will have to show his violent history because we are allowed to use, and the state will instruct you ultimately in this case, that for purposes of establishing prior violent felonies, you may also use as to each of these cases, each of these five individual murder cases about which you must make a recommendation, you will be permitted to count the other violent felonies in this case as aggravating felonies. What that means is that even though Tracy Paulus was killed after Sonia Larson, as to Sonia Larson's case, all of the subsequent felonies, all of the rapes, all of the armed murderers can be weighed in this case in that balance. Now, when you add that together, the state will show you that he has, this man has 22 prior violent felony convictions spanning 15 years in five states. That's what you will weigh in the balance against what he offers as an excuse for what he did to these young lives. There are additional aggravators that I want to talk to you about briefly. They are additional aggravators that you may weigh in the balance against whatever excuses he offers to try to avoid the death penalty the state believes he has so obviously earned. Those will be, one of which will be, excuse me, that the capital murder was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. Cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. The state will prove this factor to you in several ways. <coughs> the state will present witnesses who will define for you. We'll put those on maybe today, certainly by tomorrow, who will define for you Danny's movements and what he got before he started these crimes. We will show you that on July 17th through July 22nd, Danny Rowling was staying in the travel lodge in Tallahassee, Florida. The state was going to prove this through a veteran FDLE agent. It was while he was in that travel lodge that he purchased this knife. Now, how are we going to prove that to you? Well, we're going to provide you evidence that Danny Rowling, when he came to Gainesville, used the name Mike Kennedy. We'll show that we were able to trace that's the name that he used in Sarasota. Going backwards, we're going to be able to show you that that's the name he used in Tallahassee. The evidence from an agent, Agent Frank Troy, an agent who uh, was with the FDLE, he's going to testify that he was on this task force throughout. He also has family in Tallahassee, lived in Tallahassee, knew the area. He got the information regarding Mike Kennedy. They had information that they developed that he had come to Sarasota from Tallahassee. They went back to Tallahassee and they checked the area around the bus station. They had intelligence that he had traveled by bus. You will find that as they did a search around the area of the bus station, they went to a travel lodge. At the travel lodge, they find a hit on the name Mike Kennedy. They got the dates. We're going to find that they took that receipt. They sent it to the lab. It was Danny Harrell Road. Now we know he was in Tallahassee. Almost two years to the day later, additional information is developed. That additional information that is developed is that Danny Rowling, by way of we will show to you, has said that he bought the murder weapon in Tallahassee about a month before the crime started. Well, sure enough, we knew that he'd been at the travel lodge about a month before. Agent Troy will tell you he got a call from Agent Dix. This information was imparted to Agent Troy. Agent Troy thought about it, went down to the area of the bus station. He knew the area, and there it was, Army-Navy store. The evidence will be that he went inside that Army-Navy store, and he looked in the, and there's a knife display, and he looks down there, and there's what he knows is a military issue, K-Bar knife. He asked the lady, did you carry that knife back in 1990? She confirms that they did. 
Did you sell one between the 17th and the 22nd? She checks her sales records. We'll provide you the evidence. There was one sold in that store. This exact same knife as I hold before you now, one of these was sold. The agent purchased it because he knew now that was the only weapon that had been sold from that store that Danny tells you that he bought the knife from and told you, we'll tell you that that's the exact one that he bought. So we knew we had a replica of the murder weapon. You're going to find that when he left Tallahassee, he went to Sarasota. In Sarasota, he made some purchases, and we'll develop evidence about those. But among the things purchased in Sarasota of the most importance is a nine millimeter, nine millimeter automatic pistol. He's got his knife in one town. He's got his gun in another. We'll show you who he purchased it from and how he purchased it, how it'd be difficult to trace that purchase down in Sarasota. Now he returns. Now he comes to Gainesville, Florida. The evidence the state will provide to you will, will prove beyond any evidence, beyond any question, how the crimes were committed in several ways. Now as to planning, we already know the plan. You got the knife in one place, you got the gun in another place. When you move out of the university inn and he goes to the woods, what does he do? He goes in and he buys, as I told you before, we will prove this to you, that the time that he bought the tent, at the time that he bought the mattress, the big items he bought, the items that couldn't be revealed were the ones he stole, the screwdriver, the tape, the gloves. He's now got everything. He's in the woods. The state will prove to you how, they, how these crimes happen in a series of ways. I want to talk to you about a couple of pieces of evidence that are going to come into you after the crime scene and after the campsite because I think it's very important. Can everybody see this okay? All right. We're going to provide you evidence in the form of an audio tape of January 31st, 1993, a videotape of February the 4th, 1993, of Danny Rowling admitting the method by which and how he did these crimes. I want to identify some people to you because they're going to become important as you watch this. Uh, this will be Special Agent Dix. This will be Steve Kramer. This will be LeGrand Hewitt. They are all persons who've been assigned to the state attorney's office as investigators in the task force. <clears throat> this person right here's name is Bobby Lewis. He's an inmate or at that time was an inmate confidant of Danny Rowland. This person right here, of course, is Danny Rowland. That's going to be the setup that we're going to show you on the video and the audio. Now, I want to warn you in advance so that you don't think I've got some sort of legal dyslexia here. We're going to do this a little bit backwards, and it's real important for you to understand why. We're going to put the videotape on first. It happened on February the 4th. But it's important that we put the videotape on first, we believe, for this reason. You will hear the voices. You will see the movement. You will have testimony before the video comes on that the room was set up exactly like this both for both interviews. Therefore, you will be able to connect voices and movements and faces with who's talking so that when we play the audio tape for you, you will know and have an have ability to, to match the voice up, say, to Dix or to Lewis or to Rowley. And you will find that Danny's still staging things and, and he's still uh, uh, staging how he wants things done. He says, I'm only going to talk through, through Bobby and you'll hear all of that uh, colloquy. But what you will find out is that it, lest you have ever been misled in any other forum, Danny Rowling talks. And when there's a question about whether Bobby has said something correctly or not, you will see it. You will hear it. You will hear Bobby say something. And is that correct, Danny? Yes. Is that right, Danny? Yes. You will even see instances where Danny talks to the officers directly about what happened. You will see instances where Danny goes over and whispers to Bobby and Bobby changes some answer. That's why we want to show you the video first so you'll know and the audio will make some sense to you. Now, some of the, the stuff on the video may seem a bit confusing to you because there will be times during this video when 
uh, we talk about trying to find the knife, uh, which turned out to be a virtual search for a needle in a haystack, given the area that could be encompassed. The actual knife, the actual gloves, the, the gloves that were buried. But you will find through this that there is very, very important evidence, very important evidence that come to you as to how it happened and how each crime was carried out. And it comes from his own voice or it comes through another voice and he agrees with it. Now, I think it's important, I think I somewhat skipped ahead of myself here and I, I knew I would. Between the movements from Sarasota and the campsite, we will provide you a suit. And before we play the tape for you, so it all makes sense to you, we're going to put on evidence as to what happened in each of the various crime scenes. Now, this is very important evidence to us because you are going to see, maybe in a cropped fashion, cropped meaning that you may see some parts of the photos that the court has determined for, for various legal reasons not to show, and you will hear from time to time what's called redactions or skips. Please don't assume anything about that. That's something the court will instruct you about, both as to cropping and redaction. That's, that's matters the court has determined you wouldn't be concerned with in these proceedings. You will find at scene one, we'll show you the setup, we'll show you the apartment. We'll show you what happened at the door. We'll show you the apple and the banana he said he ate. We'll show you pictures of the bodies as they were found. You're going to see what happened to Sonia. You're going to see what happened to Christina. You're going to see the dishwashing cleanser. You're going to see the wounds to the body. On Sonia's case, just as in the case of Manuel, you're going to see not wounds just to the trunk of the body, but wounds on the hands, arms, legs where people struggled to try to come out of their sleep and stay alive, struggled unsuccessfully. We're going to show you at scene one, as I told you, and it'll be important when you see the photograph of the apple and banana, it may not make a lot of sense to you, but when you hear him say later that that's what he did, he ate an apple and he ate a banana. Now you know, after he was through, that's what he did. It all will make sense to you. You will find at scene two the evidence. We'll, we'll show you the setup of the apartment. We'll show you how the furniture was rearranged by Danny to set everything up before Krista came back so that he could facilitate what he was going to do. You will see where he broke in the back window and how, what he did to the lock. You will find the latch on the door. You'll have that testimony about that latch having been previously undone earlier in the week. You will find the entryway. You will find how he went around to the back of the apartment. We'll show you a crack down in the window where he peeked. All that will be provided to you at scene three. We're going to do the same thing. We'll set up the apartment. We'll show you the photographs. Before I leave scene two, let me back up. You will get to see how he left Krista Hoyt, and how she was found by her fellow, by a fellow worker who was trying to find out why she was late for work one night. You will then see scene three as it happened. You will be shown the, the, the apartment as it was set up. You will see the blood on the door of Tracy's room. You will know that blood came from Manny. You will find a, a black torn piece of cloth. You will see a picture of a piece of tape that, for which the windows were taped together so that nobody could see in as to see what he and detect what he was doing to this girl. You will see the blood on the wall, the spatter on the wall showing the fight that had to take place in that room. You will see the massive wound that was administered. You will see all of the wounds that was, were administered on Manuel as he struggled to stay alive. Now, why is this important? Because it shows you how these crimes were committed. You will see the tape marks because the blood won't be as obvious. Where there used to be tapes, you don't bleed the same way. Where the tape was over you, where some of the bleeding took place, You'll be able to see it. You'll see where the tape marks were around their mouths. We'll show that to you. Why is that important? Because that tells you how heinous and atrocious and cruel these murders were. 
heinous and atrocious and cruel being one of the statutory aggravators that you must weigh in the balance when you make a decision as to the recommendation to make to this court that is something that you weigh was he heinous and atrocious and cruel we'll show you the binding marks that were stripped off of these people after he was through with them after he'd raped them after he'd killed them after he'd left them The state will prove to you, after each of these scenes, we'll take you to the campsite, as I told you about. We'll show you what was found at the campsite. We'll connect those, those matters up. We'll show you that's the gun. Where's that gun from? Sarasota. We know that. We'll prove it to you. Where's that tape recorder? Well, it was used in Sarasota because there's actually going to be a Sarasota friend's voice on the tape. That's the tape that contained, that had the fingerprint. That's the tape of which he predicted, there's something i got to go do as he sat in the woods in the dark of the night and finally made his decision that he had his knife, he had his gun, he had his tools, he was ready to go. We'll prove all that to you. We will show you evidence after each crime scene and after the campsite and after you've heard the videotape that I've shown you and after you've seen the, uh, heard the audio tape, excuse me, that I've shown you. We're going to play another audio tape, excuse me, videotape for you. That will be from February the 14th. On February the 14th, you will find that the videotape was made because Danny was giving a press interview to Orlando Television. And you will see in his press interview him discuss how voluntary and reliable his statement is. You will hear him. You can see his calm and his demeanor in that tape. That will show you in which he says, I haven't been forced to give any of these statements. You listen to it. It'll speak for itself. It's Danny Rowling telling the world that what he's saying has not been coerced, forced from him in any way. It was all true. You'll see and hear him say that. After that, the state plans that it will put you put on the evidence of two inmate confidants. I ask you if you remember in jury selection about inmates. We're going, to, we're going to put at least one, maybe two, probably two, on the stand. They're going to tell you that they haven't received any favorable treatment. <clears throat> Nothing's been given them by the state attorney. Nothing's been given them by, offered to them by the state attorney in any way to induce their testimony. Their names will be Rusty Benstead, Russell Benstead, and Bobby Lewis. You will find that just the opposite of their getting something for their testimony, that in fact, because they testify, they have been shunned by some fellow inmates, that they've been segregated from their peers, that they have in fact been endangered and may be endangered by their very act of testifying in this case. They will tell you how they got the information from Danny and how he told you about it. He, how he told them about what he was doing. Rusty Binstead will come in this courtroom, he will sit down, and he will explain to you how specific things that Danny recalled about how terrified Christina was. How she would have done anything to stay alive. We will show you evidence from Rusty Binstead of how Danny, how he recalled Tracy Pauls, what she was like, what she said, and even recall specifics of her anatomy. Now, he's going to tell you also why this knife was chosen. Both people will. Danny liked this particular knife because it was good for killing. It, it has a, a blood line that makes it easier to get in and out of somebody in a hurry. It cuts right through flesh and blood. Boom. That's the testimony of how Danny explained why he selected that one. Now, just so I can prove to you, the state can prove to you how reliable Rusty Benstead's information was, we're going to present a letter in evidence. A letter that details, in graphic detail, some of which will be redacted, and once again, understand, that's by decision of the court. It won't be something anyone's trying to keep from you. It's something that you need not consider. But we will have a letter, a letter that will be put on the, up for you to view and see and that letter was given to Rusty Binstead. Now, Rusty will tell you how he coaxed it out of Danny. That letter was written by Danny Rowling, describing in 
minute detail how and what he did to Krista Hoyt and why to a degree. Just so you know that there's no playing around here on relying on unreliable information from, a, from an inmate, if that's your concern, we will bring an FDLE handwriting analyst who will tell you, I have examined that letter, and the handwriting of that letter is to the exclusion of everyone else, Danny Harold. Therefore, you'll know and be able to realize that Rusty did have this kind of access and did have this kind of information. So when he tells you, the details that Danny later recalled about his victims and how they suffered and how they didn't say anything while he talked to them, but they would try to muffle through the tentacles over their mouth. That information, you know, was from someone who had an opportunity to hear it because he's the person that was given the letter by Danny Rowe. Another inmate, Bobby Lewis, the same thing he's going to tell you how Danny bragged about treating his victims, what he did to them, the circumstances under which his attitudes would change. And he even talked to you about how he, he liked the attitude that he put on during the videotape and how he thought he was maybe pulling something over the officers the way he acted at the video. He, we will also present, of course, medical examiner testimony. Medical examiner testimony is is always vital in every case, particularly because it establishes cause of death. In this case, of course, we know the guilt phase issue of murders behind us. We know he is a, a murderer of five people. He sits there as such. But you will find that from the medical examiner, Dr. William Hamilton, he will impart to you some information that's very important. And the reason I'm telling you now is that when he gets on there, it's vital, I think, that you focus upon these kinds of issues. He's going to be able to answer some questions that may become very, very important as you consider heinous, atrocious, and cruel. He's going to, of course, he'll tell you what we already know from the tapes, and that is that the victims were bound from the, by, by the tapes, I mean the audio and the video, and from the tape marks in the pictures. But he's going to confirm that these victims were bound, their mouths were gagged. He's going to show you and explain to you from the medical ex examination that Sonia did not die mercifully in her sleep. She awoke and fought and she struggled for her life. She couldn't warn anybody. She couldn't cry out. Remember, he thought of everything. He had the table over her mouth and he stabbed her. Show you the wounds on her hands, on her legs. Tell you how long it took her to die, consistent with the testimony you will have already received about the fact that she struggled. He's going to provide you medical exam testimony about what happened to Krista. What happened to Chris Christina. He's going to be very important in providing his evidence regarding Manuel Taboda because during Manuel Taboda's examination of his room, you will find blood, you will find pictures of wounds all over him, but he's going to tell you how consistent, how it was that a man who could be stabbed that hard, like that, could get up and fight so well, could actually, as Rusty Benstead will tell you, look to the door and struggle and try to hold on to his assailant. Maybe not saving his life, but maybe Tracy's got time. We'll show you that it took, how long it took him to die because of these wounds and how many wounds had to be inflicted on him before he died. We'll show you what happened to Tracy and how Tracy, I want you to listen carefully when we get to Tracy, didn't just die right away. How long it took her to die, not how long he kept her on the bed, not how long he toyed with her, not how long he raped her, how long after he stabbed her, it took her to die. When this is through, I believe the state will have proven through its case in chief, evidence on heinous, atrocious, and cruel, evidence on cold, calculated, evidence on cruelty, excuse me, evidence on being in the course of a burglary or sexual battery, and that he's a man with a violent history, the 
all that evidence, not any reasonable doubt, will have been established to you during this case. It cheated. You will also find from this evidence, we believe, that as to Sonny and as to Manuel, they had the misfortune of being there. And Danny had spied where he wanted to be when he came into the first scene one, then scene three. Danny doesn't just take the victim. He doesn't just impulsively jump on Christina. He doesn't just impulsively go to where he'd been watching Tracy. He checks the place out. He's got to eliminate the witness. We'll show you evidence that those two people died just because they had the misfortune of being in a room where Danny wanted to rape somebody. When that is concluded, the state will have essentially shown you we submit four or five aggravating factors about which the court may instruct you to be weighed in the balance against whatever Danny says made him do what he did and what he admits he did and what we know he did. When that happens, we believe, and let me give you an ex the examples. As to Sonia, we believe that we will have shown she was killed by a person who committed first degree murder. That's already behind us. We know that she was killed by a person with a history of violence, 22 felonies, 15 years, five states. She was committed, she was killed in the commission of an armed burglary. He was armed when he broke in. He will be, have been adjudicated. He hasn't been adjudicated that. She was killed in a heinous, atrocious, and cruel fashion. She, she fought for her life. It did no good. She was, as the, she was killed as a result of a cold, calculated plan. How do we know that? Knife in Tallahassee, gun in Sarasota, stolen tools in, Ta in Gainesville, breaks into the apartment. Couldn't be denied his plan. That night had been to other places and chased away. We will have shown, for instance, that you will have five things to weigh in the balance. As to each of these people, we will go through the same process with you, and we will explain to you the evidence that will show how, as to each of them, the aggravators apply every time, every one, not one, not two, not three, maybe four, maybe five statutory aggravators under Florida law that set forth reasons that he has earned the death penalty. Now, the way the process works, that will constitute our case in chief. That's the first part of the case. But it would be remiss of me, I think, I would be negligent in my presentation to you not to, to try to explain to you what this process is in its entirety, because that will not, in all likelihood, constitute all of the cases, all of the case presented by the state. Because when the case by the state is finished as to its first phase, that is, after we've established all the statutory aggravators, which is all we can or will be allowed to produce initially. That's all we can prove is aggravating factors, statutory aggravating factors. When we finish that, the defense then has an opportunity to come in and offer, as you remember from jury selection, mitigation, both statutory and non-statutory, to try to give some reason for you not to impose the death penalty for these horrific acts, for this holocaust he created. And they may present what they want or what they have. It would be inappropriate for me to tell you what they're going to present or what, I, what, what we know they're going to present because that's not my case. Uh, it's not my job to, to tell you what their defense is going to be, but, it, but I want to tell you this, that we know from the jury selection process that we're probably going to hear issues on childhood or mental health or anything that they can offer to weigh against the statutory aggravators that they will so heavily be facing before they ever get started. They may say that he, I mean, they, they can produce whatever ever, ever evidence they want. I mean, maybe how he got along with his mom, got along with his dad, didn't, I don't know. But let me tell you why I'm predicting this. It's their job to present their mitigation, and it's their choice whether they choose to do so or not, or how they choose to do it. But if they present history as to his background, 
the state will be able to present rebuttal evidence. That's a third step that takes place. The state has an opportunity to present, and the court will only rule upon whether or not we can present certain evidence, but we will be given an opportunity to do rebuttal. Now, this is important because if they put on psychological information, the state has the same right to come back and provide it for you. If they talk about how Danny got along as a child or what his history was like, we get to put that evidence back on for you in rebuttal. I can't tell you what our rebuttal evidence is going to be now because I don't know what they're going to offer to offset the, and try to get an excuse for a man who has killed five people like this. But whatever it is, we get a chance to rebut it. And I'm asking you to commit to me that you will keep an open mind when you hear whatever their psychiatrist, psychologist, or friends of the family say, we still get to present rebuttal evidence to that. And it's real important that when they put on a psychologist, don't make up your mind if what he says, you wait to hear what ours says. When they say what his history is, you wait to hear what we say his history is. I need that commitment from you. I, I'm reminded uh, when I think about keeping an open mind on this, uh, when I was a kid, there used to be a revivalist would come to the town. I'm, I'm convinced that the way he would convince most of us children to come back was he would start a drawing on Monday night. And he would only draw so much of it that Monday night and stop in the sermon. Then Tuesday night and stop. And all during that week, you'd be absolutely convinced you knew what that picture was. Well, you never would because the next night you'd change it just a little bit until the fifth night of the revival, you would see the whole picture. That's all I'm asking you to do. When they try to put on mitigation about whether you got along with mom or dad or whatever they offer, keep an open mind. Because those last flourishes those last little addition of colors, the palette being applied in the final instant gives you the full picture, and we're entitled to that. And I submit to you that when this case is over with, whatever they've offered in mitigation will be sadly less in the balance because of the rebuttal to that mitigation we can prove and will prove to you. When we're through with rebuttal, we go to closing argument. The court will allow us to get up and summarize again for you what we have proven and then to argue from that evidence what we believe should happen. You were selected through a difficult process. The state has complete trust that you will follow your oaths and you will do a duty, and it is a duty, to be good jurors. You told us you would. We know you will. And we feel like at the end of this evidence, you will find, as I have shown you, that as to Sonia Larson, the aggravation is massive. As to Christine Powell, the aggravation is massive. As to Crystal Hoyt, the aggravation is massive. As to Manuel Tabota, the aggravation is massive. As to Tracy Paulus, the aggravation is massive weighs so heavily in favor of the death penalty that he has earned. But it will be your duty to go through that weighing process and to make that recommendation to his honor for a sentencing recommendation. One, he has explained to you that he gives great weight to you. Two, it is an ominous responsibility that you are about to impart on, and I know that. And we knew that during jury selection. And that's why at each stage of this process, the screw turns a little tighter. We know that. But you took an oath. Then you took another oath. And then you took another oath. And that oath is recorded, not so much by that recorder, reporter, but it's recorded in your hearts that you will do your duty as, your, as jurors. The court will explain to you what that means. But you know already what this process is. And we know at the completion of this process, when you have gone through this balance, you will return and you will have done your duty. We don't expect you to do more. We cannot allow you to do less. And that process will mean that when it's over with, you will find as to everyone, as to Sonia Larson, you will have to come back and say a death penalty recommendation. As to Trace, as to Christine Powell, you will have to return a death penalty recommendation. As to Krista Hoyt, you will have to return a death penalty recommendation. As to Manuel Tabota, you will have to return a death penalty recommendation. You will return a death penalty recommendation. As to Tracy Paul, you will do it because that's what the law requires when the weight so obviously balances that way. You will do it because you are going to be honest to your oath, and you will do it because it is what the law requires and what you have sworn you would do. 
We have every trust in your judgment over the next few days. You will never be found wanting in the balance. But he will. Thank you. Thank you.